Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be talking about Uber. Now some of my friends like to call me an Uber driver because I can comfortably fit three riders in my back seat. But nonetheless, today we'll be talking about the architecture of the application itself, so let's go ahead and get into it. Uber is a ride hailing app. When I want to ride, I enter my pickup and drop off location. From there, the app asks drivers around me if they're interested in participating. Once I'm matched with a driver, I can see the driver's location. Once I enter the driver's car, he'll take me the rest of the way. Personally, I always try to get myself in a comfortable white van. For the sake of this video, we're mainly going to focus on a small subset of the functionality that's in the Uber app. Firstly, we want a potential passenger to be able to request a ride. Next, we want to send this ride request to nearby drivers with the purpose of ultimately generating a match between rider and driver. Finally, we'll need to show the rider and driver each each other's locations until the ride commences. Let's add in one more non-functional requirement. A user should not be able to request multiple rides at a time. There are a lot of aspects of Uber that we're not going to cover in this video. These include route generation, ride pricing algorithms, reviews, and much more. According to some online estimates, Uber has 200 million potential riders and 10 million active drivers in their force. Keep in mind that Uber basically always needs to keep track of the location of drivers so they can be matched to nearby riders. Since these are cars, their location can actually change pretty quickly. That means we should be having these drivers pinging our servers with their location every few seconds. Even if it doesn't take us too much storage to store the location of each driver, the actual load for millions of pings per second to a server is likely too much for a single box. We're going to have to do some work to scale this out horizontally. The first thing that we'll discuss when talking about Uber is how to request a ride. At a high level, the passenger is going to pass in an address for their starting location and an address for their destination. As we discussed in our previous video, there are many different APIs that can help us convert these two coordinates. Separately, there are many APIs to figure out the path to get from point A to point B, notably Google Maps. We could use a very simple calculation on route distance and estimated time to provide the user with a price quote. In reality, Uber is going to be looking at supply and demand in order to generate a ride price. Once a user asks for a ride, we should persist that information to a database. If we instead decided to cache this information on a server, we'd expose ourselves to two failure scenarios. The first is that a user could request another ride on a separate server. The other is that the server could fail and the user's ride request would just be lost. While you could choose to attempt to map a user to a single server, it adds a bunch of complexity in the face of server failures, and it feels like we should just put this application state in a persistent database where we don't have to worry about losing it. Let's consider the schema of the rides table. It should have a ride ID, a start location, an end location, a creation timestamp, a status, which could be requested, claimed, active, complete, or canceled. We probably also need a passenger ID here, as well as a driver ID, which can be filled out when the ride is claimed. We also likely want an auxiliary table known as active passenger ride, which allows us to track the current ride that a passenger is a part of. This will just point to a single object in the rides table. The reason that it's useful to have this denormalization is that we'll also eventually need drivers to be able to track the rides that they're linked to. It would be very hard to maintain an index on driver ID and rider ID on the same table, which is horizontally scaled. We could use something like change data capture, but that introduces a bit of latency, which we likely don't want here. Let's summarize our ride requesting flow. A user gets a ride and passes in a latitude and longitude for their pickup point. The first thing we do is check whether they already have a ride request out there. If so, the application server acts based on the state of the existing ride object. Maybe we have to keep searching for a driver for the ride, or maybe we have to start sending the user's location to a paired driver. If not, we create it by first adding an entry to the active passenger ride table, and then adding one to the rides table itself. At this point, we can now start searching for a driver. Notice how we're performing our two writes sequentially. Doing so allows us to avoid a potentially slow distributed transaction. That being said, we want to be pretty careful about the ordering here. If we write to the rides table first, we get a situation where a row is added to the rides table, but never to the active passenger table. Then, we could match our passenger with the driver, and if the passenger all of a sudden connects to a new server, they wouldn't know about their claimed ride. Using the order shown in the diagram ensures that a passenger will be guaranteed to track any ride that is created for them. Even if the write to the rides table fails, it's totally fine, the passenger will see that there's no corresponding ride object for their row in the active passenger ride table and realize there's been an error. When looking for a potential driver, we basically need to do the following. First, consider all drivers in the vicinity of the pickup point. Then, prioritize a couple of the closest ones and notify them about the ride request. If nobody accepts, keep sending notifications to more drivers. Finally, 
When one driver accepts, match them to the ride and ensure that nobody else can claim it. These steps imply that we need to know a pretty critical piece of information, the locations of all the drivers. As drivers have their Uber app open, they should be sending their location to our backend every few seconds. Fortunately, cellular devices have a GPS inside of them, and we can take advantage of that to send their latitude and longitude to our servers. That being said, we also need to store their locations in a manner such that we can quickly find a set of the closest drivers to our potential rider. Fortunately, we discussed how to do this in our previous video about Yelp. Just watch that if you want more details on this section. To summarize, we can use a geospatial index. This allows us to easily find all points within a fixed distance of our rider. For example, when Pornhub tells me that there are 100 MILFs who are interested in me within a 5 mile radius, they're clearly using one of these. Now that we're employing a geospatial index, we have a list of potential candidate drivers for our ride. We can use a short TTL for each location update. This way we don't have to manually expire the prior known location for each driver. This becomes especially useful when the driver may be switching between partitions of our geospatial index, allowing us to avoid a distributed transaction. Uber could choose to contact potential drivers using many different strategies. They could send the ride request to one driver, or all of them. In reality, it's probably somewhere between those two, with our backend server doing a bit of additional logic to notify a few top candidates. We probably also want to check if our candidate is currently serving rides, since that means they have to get to their destination point before picking up the next passenger. If we don't hear back within a few seconds, we can send the ride request to even more candidates. Sending these actual notifications to the drivers isn't a trivial detail either. Each driver doesn't know in advance that it's going to receive a ride offer at a given time, so its device isn't proactively requesting them. Instead, we need a way to notify our driver. When it comes to doing real-time communication between a server and a client, we've got a few options. The first is to have the client pull the server on a loop. This works nicely sometimes because polling is inherently stateless, and the client can easily switch over to another server if the one that they're connected to goes down. That being said, polling has the disadvantage of having to add a bunch of request headers to every single request. Given the frequency of requests with which drivers send their location to our servers, this could be significant. Instead, a persistent connection may be better for us, which can be established once. We now have two options, WebSockets and Service and Events. The former is bidirectional, which is actually really nice for our use case of drivers and passengers sending and receiving data. If my backend actually wants to send data to a driver, it needs to know which server that driver is connected to. It'll then first route the data to the server, which forwards it to the driver over the WebSocket. We need to maintain a mapping of this information somewhere. We can use another database for this with a table called Driver Sessions. This guy has a schema of driver ID and server IP address, with the driver ID being the primary key. If the driver connection gets broken and reestablished on another server, we'll overwrite the previous session. When a driver accepts a ride, two things need to happen. First, the driver needs to note down the fact that they've accepted it. Second, we need to prohibit anybody else from claiming this ride. We accomplish the first by introducing the driver active rides table. It looks very similar to the passenger active ride table, except a driver can be matched to many different rides at once. After we add a row there, we'll update the corresponding row in the rides table, as long as it has a null driver ID. Like before, we can update our driver active rides table before the main rides table to avoid a costly two-phase commit. We've already gone through how the driver likely wants to be connected to our backend via a WebSocket. That being said, passengers should do the same. This is because after a passenger requests a ride, it needs to both receive and request a ton of information back from the server, such as fetching the status of their ride requests and sending their location to the driver. For passengers to receive information from other servers, we can do something similar to what we did for drivers and introduce a passenger sessions table. This will be updated when a passenger establishes a WebSocket connection and can be referenced when trying to send data to a particular passenger ID. When a passenger and driver are matched, they need to begin sending their location to one another. The rider can see the driver's ID in the ride table and from there use the driver session table to figure out which server to forward their location to. On the driver side, things are basically the same but opposite. We first pull in any rides that they're actively serving or have claimed and send their location to those servers. While it isn't pictured in the diagram, it's also the case that the driver is still sending their location to the driver location index since they may continue to claim requested rides. When a driver completes a ride, we can first mark it as complete in the rides table and then mark it complete in the driver rides table. This way, both the passenger and driver will know to stop sending location updates to one another. It's time to go through our high-level design one step at a time. 
One key tenet I want to emphasize here is trying to make this a state machine. In this case, that means I don't want any of our backend servers to be the source of truth. If they are, they can fail and things will be left in an inconsistent state. Instead, by persisting every state change to a database, any random server can pick up right where another one left off and start doing the same exact thing. Let's now go through our full user flow, beginning from when a user makes a ride request. The first thing that they'll do is establish a WebSocket with one of our backend servers. From there, we'll add the connection into the user sessions table. The server will then check if that user has any outgoing ride requests by joining the passenger active ride table with the rides table. If there's a ride in progress or one that needs to be claimed by a driver, it can just resume where things left off. If there are no in progress rides for the user, the server creates one and then begins to search for nearby drivers. First, the server fetches a list of close drivers and then picks a few to notify about the ride request. If nobody accepts the request for some time, our server will send the notification to more drivers. In order for servers to know how to route these messages to drivers, we need a driver sessions table. This gets populated when drivers establish connection to our backend. From there, the passenger server reads the driver sessions table and routes messages to drivers through a WebSocket. This entire time, a driver's device sends its location every few seconds to the driver location index. This ping should expire on its own fairly quickly. Otherwise, a driver that closes their app may still be pinged for potential rides. Let's now imagine that one of the drivers chooses to accept a ride proposal. The first thing it will do is add a row to the driver rides table, which should point to the ride object. From there, we'll update the ride row itself, adding the driver ID. At this point, no other driver can claim the ride. Our user server should start getting location pings from the driver shortly after, letting it know to stop looking for suitable drivers. Drivers need to forward their location to all matched passengers. As a reminder though, even when they're doing this, they must still ping the location index. To ping their passengers, we can join the driver rides with the rides table to get the user IDs in question, and then consult the user sessions table to figure out which servers those passengers are connected to. The passenger server will also have to forward the passenger's location to their driver. It can do so by consulting the driver sessions table and routing that message accordingly. In my opinion, this video was long enough and complex enough that we should leave the discussion of our driver location index to a separate one. We know that we're sending this guy millions of updates per second, but what's the most intelligent way to horizontally scale it out? In our next video, we're going to introduce a new concept, geosharding. Thanks for sticking around this long, everybody. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about how to split that location index right in two. Wish someone would come along and split me right in two, but I guess we'll have to wait for another week. See you all in the next one.